Hello everyone, we are here, with another video on antihypertensive agents. In this video we will discuss Drugs that alter sympathetic nervous system function, that are, sympathoplegic agents. Let's begin. In numerous patients, hypertension is initiated, and sustained at least in part, by sympathetic neural activation. In patients with moderate to severe hypertension, most effective drug regimens include an agent that inhibits function of the sympathetic nervous system. Drugs in this group are classified according to the site at which they impair the sympathetic reflex arc, which we have already discussed in our introductory video. This neuroanatomic classification clarifies major differences in cardiovascular effects of drugs, and help the clinician to predict, interactions of these drugs, with one another, and with other drugs. Drugs that lower blood pressure, by actions on the central nervous system, tend to cause sedation and mental depression, and may produce disturbances of sleep, including nightmares. Drugs that act, by inhibiting transmission, through autonomic ganglia, that are, ganglion blockers, produce toxicity, from inhibition of parasympathetic regulation, in addition to profound sympathetic blockade, and are no longer used. Drugs that act chiefly, by reducing release of norepinephrine from sympathetic nerve endings, cause effects, that are like those of surgical sympathectomy, including inhibition of ejaculation, and hypotension, that is increased, by upright posture, and after exercise. Drugs that block postsynaptic adrenoceptors produce a more selective spectrum of effects, depending on the class of receptor to which they bind. Renal sympathetic denervation is effective in lowering blood pressure in patients with hypertension resistant to antihypertensive drugs. Finally, it should be noted that all the agents that lower blood pressure by altering sympathetic function can elicit compensatory effects through mechanisms that are not dependent on adrenergic nerves. Thus, the antihypertensive effect of any of these agents, used alone, may be limited by retention of sodium by the kidney and expansion of blood volume. That's why sympathoplegic antihypertensive drugs are most effective when used alongside a diuretic. Let's discuss sympathoplegic antihypertensive drugs in detail. First one are centrally acting sympathoplegic drugs. These agents reduce sympathetic outflow from basomotor centers in the brainstem, but allow these centers to retain or even increase their sensitivity to baroreceptor control. Accordingly, the antihypertensive and toxic actions of these drugs are generally less dependent on posture than are the effects of drugs that act directly on peripheral sympathetic neurons. First drug that we are going to discuss is alpha-methyldopa. Alpha-methyldopa was widely used in the past, but is now used primarily for hypertension during pregnancy. Alpha-methyldopa is an analog of L-dopa. This alpha-2 agonist is converted to alpha-methylnorepinephrine centrally to diminish the adrenergic outflow from the CNS. Alpha-methylnorepinephrine is stored in adrenergic nerve vesicles, where it stoichiometrically replaces norepinephrine and is released by nerve. Alpha-methyldopa's antihypertensive action appears to be due to stimulation of central alpha adrenoceptors by alpha-methylnorepinephrine. It lowers blood pressure chiefly by reducing peripheral vascular resistance with a variable reduction in heart rate and cardiac output. It has been used in hypertensive pregnant patients. Because blood flow to kidney is not diminished by its use, it is especially valuable in treating hypertensive patients with renal insufficiency. 
Alpha-methyldopa enters the brain via an aromatic amino acid transporter. The usual oral dose of methyl dopa produces its maximal antihypertensive effect in 4 to 6 hours, and the effect can persist for up to 24 hours. Because the effect depends on accumulation and storage of a metabolite, alpha methylnorepinephrine in the vesicles of nerve endings, the action persists after the parent drug has disappeared from the circulation. The bioavailability of methyl dopa is 25%, while its half-life is 2 hours. The most common side effects of alpha-methyl dopa are, sedation and drowsiness. With long-term therapy, patients may complain of, persistent mental lassitude and impaired mental concentration. Nightmares, mental depression, vertigo, and extrapyramidal signs may occur but are relatively infrequent. Lactation, associated with increased prolactin secretion, can occur both in men and in women, treated with methyl dopa. Other important adverse effects of methyl dopa are development of a positive Coombs test, occurring in 10 to 20% of patients, undergoing therapy, for longer than 12 months, which sometimes makes, cross-matching blood for transfusion difficult, and rarely is associated with, hemolytic anemia, as well as hepatitis and drug fever. Discontinuation of the drug usually results in prompt reversal of these abnormalities. Alpha methyl dopa is available in tablet form, having the strengths of 250 mg and 500 mg, and in parenteral form, having the strength of 50 mg per milliliter. Suggested initial dose of alpha methyl dopa is 250 mg two or three times a day in the first 48 hours. Usual maintenance dose range of alpha methyl dopa is 500 mg to 2 g in 2 to 4 doses. Maximum recommended daily dosage of alpha methyl dopa is 3 g. In moderate renal insufficiency, there is no requirement to reduce the dose of alpha methyl dopa. Next one is clonidine. It is a 2-imidacillin derivative. The antihypertensive action of clonidine was discovered while testing the drug for use as a nasal decongestant. The hypotensive effect of clonidine is exerted at alpha adrenoceptors in the medulla of the brain. Clonidine reduces sympathetic and increases parasympathetic tone, resulting in blood pressure lowering and bradycardia. The reduction in pressure is accompanied by a decrease in circulating catecholamine levels. These observations indicate that clonidine sensitizes brainstem basomotor centers to inhibition by baroreflexes. Blood pressure lowering by clonidine results from reduction of cardiac output due to decreased heart rate and relaxation of capacitance vessels, as well as a reduction in peripheral vascular resistance. Reduction in arterial blood pressure by clonidine is accompanied by decreased renal vascular resistance and maintenance of renal blood flow. Clonidine reduces blood pressure in the supine position and only rarely causes postural hypotension. It is primarily used for the treatment of hypertension that has not responded adequately to the treatment with two or more drugs. It does not decrease renal blood flow of glomerular filtration, therefore, it is useful in the treatment of hypertension complicated by renal disease. As it may cause sodium and water retention, it may be administered in combination with diuretic. Clonidine is lipid soluble and rapidly enters the brain from the circulation. It is well absorbed after oral administration and excreted by kidney. The bioavailability of clonidine is 95%, while its half-life is 8 to 12 hours. Adverse effects of clonidine are generally mild, but the drug can produce sedation and drying of nasal mucosa. Both effects are centrally mediated and dose-dependent and overlap temporally with the drug's antihypertensive effect. Withdrawal of clonidine 
after prolonged use, mainly with high dosages, more than 1 mg per day, can lead to life-threatening hypertensive crisis, mediated by increased sympathetic nervous activity. Patient Shell Nervousness Tachycardia Headache and Sweating After emitting one or two doses of the drug Because of this risk, all patients who take clonidine should be warned of the possibility. If the drug must be stopped, it should be gradually withdrawn, while other antihypertensive agents are being substituted. Treatment of the hypertensive crisis include Reinstitution of clonidine therapy, or Administration of alpha and beta adrenoceptor blocking agents Concurrent treatment with tricyclic antidepressants may block the antihypertensive effect of clonidine. The interaction is believed to be due to alpha adrenoceptor blocking actions of the tricyclics. Clonidine should not be given to patients who are at risk for mental depression and should be withdrawn if depression occurs during therapy. As it is comparatively short half-life and the fact that its antihypertensive effect is directly related to blood concentration, oral clonidine must be given twice a day or as a patch to maintain smooth blood pressure control. A transdermal preparation of clonidine that reduces blood pressure for 7 days after a single application is also accessible. This preparation seems to produce less sedation than clonidine tablets but is often linked with local skin reactions. Transdermal patches of clonidine are available that release 0.1, 0.2 and 0.3 mg per 24 hours. For extended release suspension, suggested initial dose of clonidine is 0.17 mg or 2 ml once a day, given at bedtime. Usual dose range of clonidine is 0.17 mg or 2 ml to 0.52 mg or 6 ml per day. For extended release tablets, suggested initial dose of clonidine is 0.17 mg once a day given at bedtime. Usual dose range of clonidine is 0.17 mg to 0.52 mg per day. Tablets of clonidine are available in strength of 0.1 mg, 0.2 mg and 0.3 mg tablets. Suggested initial dose of clonidine is 0.1 mg two times a day, taken in the morning and at bedtime. Usual dose range of clonidine is 0.2 mg to 0.6 mg per day. In moderate renal insufficiency, it is required to reduce the dose of clonidine. The doctor may adjust the dose of clonidine as needed. For children, the use and dose must be determined by the doctor. If the patient misses the dose of this drug, it is advised to take it as soon as possible. If it is almost the time for the next dose, it is recommended to skip the missed dose and go back to normal dosing schedule and not to double the doses. Upcoming are ganglion blocking agents. Traditionally, drugs that block activation of postganglionic autonomic neurons by acetylcholine were among the first agents used in the treatment of hypertension. Most of these drugs are no longer available clinically because of intolerable toxicities related to their primary action. Ganglion blocking agents competitively block nicotinic cholinoceptors on postganglionic neurons in both sympathetic and parasympathetic ganglia. In addition to this, these drugs may directly block the nicotinic acetylcholine channel in the same fashion as neuromuscular nicotinic blockers. The adverse effects of ganglion blockers are, direct extensions of their pharmacologic effects. These effects include both, sympathoplegia including excessive orthostatic hypotension and sexual dysfunction and parasympathoplegia, including constipation, urinary retention, precipitation of glaucoma, blurred vision, dry mouth, etc. These severe toxicities are the key reason 
for the disuse of ganglion blockers, for the therapy of hypertension. Mechamylamine is available in tablet form, having the strength of 2.5 mg. Next are adrenergic neuron blocking agents. These agents lower blood pressure by preventing normal physiologic release of norepinephrine from postganglionic sympathetic neurons. First adrenergic neuron blocking agent that we are going to discuss is guanethidine. It inhibits the release of norepinephrine from sympathetic nerve endings. This effect is probably responsible for most of the sympathoplegia that occurs in patients. Quinethidine is transported across the sympathetic nerve membrane by the same mechanism that transports norepinephrine itself and uptake is essential for the drug's action. Once quinethidine has entered the nerve, it is concentrated in transmitter vesicles where it replaces norepinephrine. Because it replaces norepinephrine, the drug causes a gradual depletion of norepinephrine stores in the nerve ending. As neuronal uptake is necessary for the hypotensive activity of guanethidine, drugs that block the catecholamine uptake process or displace amines from the nerve terminal block its effects. These include cocaine, amphetamine, tricyclic antidepressants, phenothiazines, and phenoxybenzamine. Quinethidine has long half-life, that is, 5 days, that's why the onset of sympathoplegia is gradual, and the maximal effect occurs in 1-2 to two weeks, and sympathoplegia persists for a comparable period after cessation of therapy. The dose should not generally be increased at intervals shorter than 2 weeks. In high enough doses, guanethidine can produce intense sympathoplegia. The result in high maximal efficacy of this drug made it the foundation of outpatient therapy of severe hypertension for many years. The bioavailability of guanethidine is 3 to 50 percent. Therapeutic use of guanethidine is often associated with symptomatic postural hypotension and hypotension following exercise, particularly when the drug is given in high doses. Quinethidine-induced sympathoplegia in men may be associated with delayed or retrograde ejaculation that is into the bladder. Quinethidine commonly causes diarrhea, which results from increased gastrointestinal motility due to parasympathetic predominance in controlling the activity of intestinal smooth muscle. Quinethidine is now rarely used because of its adverse effects. Quinethidine is too polar to enter the central nervous system. Due to this, this drug has none of the central effects seen with many of the other antihypertensive agents. Sympathomimetic agents, at doses available in over the counter cold preparations, can produce hypertension in patients taking guanethidine. Quinethidine can produce hypertensive crisis by releasing catecholamines in patients with pheochromocytoma. When tricyclic antidepressants are administered to patients taking guanethidine, the drug's antihypertensive effect is diminished and severe hypertension may follow. Quinethidine is available in tablet form, having the strengths of 10 mg and 25 mg. Suggested initial dose of guanethidine is 10 mg per day. Usual dose range of guanethidine is 25 to 50 mg per day. In moderate renal insufficiency, it might be possible to reduce to dose of guanethidine. Next drug is reserpine. It is an alkaloid extracted from the roots of an Indian plant, Rawolfia serpentina. It was one of the first effective drugs used on a large scale in the treatment of hypertension. Currently, it is rarely used due to its adverse effects. Reserpine blocks the ability of aminergic transmitter vesicles to take up and store biogenic amines, probably by interfering with the vesicular membrane associated transporter. 
This effect occurs throughout the body, resulting in depletion of norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin in both central and peripheral neurons. Chromaffin granules of the adrenal medulla are also depleted of catecholamines, although to a lesser extent, than are the vesicles of neurons. Reserpine's effects on adrenergic vesicles appear irreversible. Trace amounts of the drug remain bound to vesicular membranes for many days. At lower doses, used for treatment of mild hypertension, reserpine lowers blood pressure by a combination of decreased cardiac output and decreased peripheral vascular resistance. The half-life of reserpine is 24 to 48 hours, and its bioavailability is 50%. Reserpine readily enters the brain, and depletion of cerebral amine stores causes sedation, mental depression, and Parkinsonism symptoms. At the low doses, usually administered, reserpine produces little postural hypotension. Less commonly, ordinary low doses of reserpine produce extrapyramidal effects resembling Parkinson's disease, perhaps because of dopamine depletion in the corpus striatum. Although these central effects are rare, it should be emphasized that they may occur at any time, even after months of uneventful treatment. High doses of reserpine typically produce sedation, lassitude, nightmares, and severe mental depression. Rarely, these effects occur even in patients receiving low doses that is 0.25 mg per day. Patients with a history of mental depression should not be given reserpine and the drug should be stopped if depression appears. The drug should not be given to patients with a history of peptic ulcer, as it often produces mild diarrhea and gastrointestinal cramps and increases gastric acid secretion. Reserpine is available in tablet form, having the strengths of 0.1 mg and 0.25 mg. Suggested initial dose of reserpine is 0.25 mg per day. Usual dose range of reserpine is 0.25 mg per day. In moderate renal insufficiency, it is not required to reduce the dose of reserpine. Forthcomings are alpha adrenoceptor blocking agents. Prezosin, teresosin, and doxazosin are three alpha adrenoceptor blocking agents, which are used in the treatment of hypertension. These drugs produce most of their antihypertensive effects by competitive block of alpha-1 adrenoceptors. They decrease peripheral vascular resistance and lower arterial blood pressure by causing relaxation of both arterial and venous smooth muscles. They cause minimal changes in cardiac output, renal blood flow and glomerular filtration rate, thereby causing salt and water retention. Prezosin is used to treat mild to moderate hypertension, and it is prescribed in combination with propranolol or diuretic for additive effects. The drugs are more effective when used in combination with other agents, such as a beta blocker and a diuretic, than when used alone. Because of side effect profile, development of tolerance, and the availability of safer antihypertensives, alpha blockers are rarely used in the treatment of hypertension. Due to their beneficial effects in men with prostatic hyperplasia and bladder obstruction symptoms, these drugs are used mostly in men with concurrent hypertension and benign prostate hyperplasia. Prezosin has half-life of 3 to 4 hours and its bioavailability is 70%. Teresosin is also extensively metabolized, but undergoes very little first-pass metabolism, and has a half-life of 12 hours. Doxazosin has an intermediate bioavailability, and a half-life of 22 hours. Postural hypotension may occur in some individuals. Reflex tachycardia 
and first dose syncope are almost universal adverse effects. Concurrent use of beta blocker may be necessary to lessen the short term effect of reflex tachycardia. An increased rate of congestive heart failure occurs in patients taking prazosin alone in comparison to patients taking thiazide diuretic alone. Other reported toxicities of the alpha-1 blockers are relatively infrequent and mild. These include dizziness, palpitations, headache, and lassitude. Some patients develop a positive test for antinuclear factor in serum while on prazosin therapy, but this has not been associated with rheumatic symptoms. Prazosin is available in capsule form, having the strengths of 1 mg, 2 mg, and 5 mg. The suggested initial dose of prazosin is 3 mg per day with a usual maintenance dose range of 10 to 30 mg per day. Teresacin is available in tablet and capsule forms, having the strengths of 1 mg, 2 mg, 5 mg, and 10 mg. Teresacin can often be given 1 mg once daily orally at bedtime, with doses of 1 to 5 mg per day, or every 12 hours, and the dose may be increased, up to 20 mg per day. Doxazosin is available in tablet form, having the strengths of 1 mg, 2 mg, 4 mg and 8 mg. The dose of doxazosin is 1 mg orally, every day in morning, or in afternoon. The dose may be titrated, by doubling daily dose, up to 16 mg every day, based on blood pressure response. The usual dose range of doxazosin is, 1 to 2 mg every day. If therapy is discontinued for several days, dose is initiated at 1 mg every day, and titrated using initial dosing regimen. Due to relatively little postural hypotension, shortly after the first dose is absorbed, the first dose should be small, and should be administered at bedtime. Although the exact mechanism of this first dose phenomenon is not clear, it occurs generally in patients who are salt and volume depleted. Phentalamine and phenoxybenzamine are non-selective alpha adrenergic antagonists. Phentalamine competitively block the alpha adrenergic receptors, leading to muscle relaxation and widening of blood vessels, resulting in lowering of blood pressure. Phenoxybenzamine decreases vasoconstriction and vascular resistance by covalently bonding with the component of alpha adrenergic receptor, causing a vasodilative effect, since alpha adrenergic receptors are present throughout the walls of blood vessels which leads to a drop in blood pressure. Phentalamine is used to treat hypertension and hypertensive crisis, attributable to the effects of noradrenaline. These agents are useful in diagnosis and treatment of pheochromocytoma to control episodes of hypertension and in other clinical situations, associated with exaggerated release of catecholamines, such as phentalamine may be combined with propranolol, to treat the clonidine withdrawal syndrome. The common side effects of phentalamine include Stuffy nose Dizziness Temporary redness on neck and face Orthostatic hypertension Nausea vomiting, diarrhea, and stomach cramps. The common side effects of phenoxybenzamine include stuffy nose, mild dizziness, drowsiness, blurred vision, upset stomach, and tiredness. Phentalamine is available in powder form for injection, in the strength of 5 mg, and as injectable solution, in the strength of 0.4 mg per 1.7 ml. Its dose for hypertensive crisis, secondary to catecholamine excesses, 
5 to 15 mg intravenously. Phenoxybenzamine is available in capsule form, having the strength of 10 mg. Dose of phenoxybenzamine, for hypertension pheochromocytoma is, 10 mg orally, every 12 hours initially, and dose may be increased to, 20 to 40 mg orally, every 12 hours, or every 8 hours. Sometimes higher doses are needed. Following our alpha, beta adrenoceptor blocking agents. Labetalol and carvedilol block both alpha-1 and beta-1 and beta-2 receptors, and have vasodilating effects. Blood pressure is lowered, by reduction of systemic vascular resistance, via alpha blockade, without significant alteration, in heart rate or cardiac output. Because of combined alpha and beta blocking activity, the beta lol is useful in treating the hypertension of pheochromocytoma and hypertensive emergencies. Although carvedilol is an effective antihypertensive agent, it is mainly used in the treatment of heart failure, and it has shown to reduce mortality associated with heart failure. Labetalol has an absolute bioavailability of approximately 25%, and the elimination half-life of this drug is approximately 6 hours. The average half-life of carvedilol is 7 to 10 hours, and it has bioavailability of 25 to 35%. Side effects of labetalol include Blurred vision, or other changes in vision Chills Cold sweat Dizziness, faintness, or lightheadedness when getting up from lying or sitting position Nausea Shortness of breath Swelling of face, fingers, feet, or lower legs Tightness in chest, and Wheezing Side effects of carvedilol include Blurred vision Dizziness Dry eyes Extreme hunger Extreme thirst Frequent urination Hyperglycemia Joint pain Vision change and Weakness Labetalol is available in tablet form, having strengths of 100 mg, 200 mg, and 300 mg and parenteral form, having the strength of 5 mg per milliliter. Oral daily doses of labetalol range from 200 to 2400 mg per day. Labetalol is given as, repeated intravenous bolus injections of 20 to 80 mg, to treat hypertensive emergencies. Carvedilol is available in tablet form, having the strengths of 3.125 mg, 6.25 mg, 12.5 mg, and 25 mg and extended release capsules having the strengths of 10 mg, 20 mg, 40 mg, and 80 mg. The usual starting dosage of carvedilol for ordinary hypertension is 6.25 mg twice daily. Among a number of beta blockers tested, most have been indicated to be effective in lowering blood pressure. The pharmacologic properties of many of these agents differ in ways that may confer therapeutic benefits in specific clinical situation. Beta blockers are currently recommended as first-line drug therapy for hypertension when concomitant disease is present, such as with heart failure. Beta blockers primarily reduce the blood pressure by decreasing cardiac output. They may also decrease sympathetic outflow from the central nervous system and inhibit the release of renin from the kidneys, thus decreasing the formation of angiotensin II and the secretion of aldosterone. Propranolol is a prototype beta blocker, which act at both beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. Propranolol decreases blood pressure, primarily as a result of a decrease in cardiac output. Metoprolol and antenolol are cardioselective. 
Metoprolol is approximately equipotent to propranolol, in inhibiting stimulation of beta-1 adrenoceptors, such as those in the heart, but 50 to 100-fold, less potent than propranolol, in blocking beta-2 receptors. Nadolol and Cartiolol are non-selective beta receptor antagonists. Batoxolol and Basoprolol are beta-1 selective blockers. Pindolol, Acibutolol, and Penbutolol are partial agonists, that is, beta blockers with some intrinsic sympathomimetic activity. Esmolol is a beta-1 selective blocker. All beta adrenoceptor blocking agents are useful for lowering blood pressure in mild to moderate hypertension. Beta blockers are more effective for treating hypertension in white than in black patients and in young compared to elderly patients. In severe hypertension, beta blockers are especially useful in preventing the reflex tachycardia that often results from treatment with direct vasodilators. Beta blockers are useful in treating conditions that may coexist with hypertension, such as supraventricular tachyarrhythmia, previous myocardial infarction, angina pectoris, chronic heart failure, and migraine headache. Beta blockers have been shown to reduce mortality after a myocardial infarction, and some also reduce mortality in patients with heart failure. They are particularly advantageous for treating hypertension in patients with these conditions. In mild to moderate hypertension, propranolol produces a significant reduction in blood pressure without prominent postural hypotension. Propranolol has now been largely replaced by cardioselective beta blockers such as metoprolol and atenolol. Relative cardioselectivity of metoprolol may be advantageous in treating hypertensive patients who also suffer from asthma, diabetes, or peripheral vascular disease. Although cardioselectivity is not complete, metoprolol causes less bronchial constriction than propranolol at doses that produce equal inhibition of beta-1 adrenoceptor responses. Because of significantly greater agonist than antagonist effects at beta-2 receptors, pindolol, acibutolol, and penbutolol may be particularly beneficial for patients with bradyarrhythmias or peripheral vascular disease. Esmolol is used for management of intraoperative and postoperative hypertension and sometimes for hypertensive emergencies, particularly when hypertension is associated with tachycardia. Propranolol has a half-life of 3 to 5 hours, while its bioavailability is 25%. Metoprolol is extensively metabolized by CYP2D6, with high first-pass metabolism. Metoprolol has a relatively short half-life of 4 to 6 hours, but the extended release preparation can be dosed, once daily. Its bioavailability is 40%. Atenolol is not extensively metabolized, and is excreted primarily in the urine, with a half-life of 6 hours. Its bioavailability is 60%. Nadolol and Cartiolol are not appreciably metabolized and are excreted to a considerable extent in the urine. Metoxolol and Basoprolol are primarily metabolized in the liver but have long half-lives. Esmolol is rapidly metabolized via hydrolysis by red blood cell esterases. It has a short half-life, that is, 9 to 10 minutes. The beta blockers may cause bradycardia and hypotension. They may cause CNS side effects, such as fatigue, lethargy, insomnia, and hallucinations. The beta blockers may decrease libido and cause impotence. The beta blockers may disturb lipid metabolism, decreasing high-density lipoprotein cholesterol, and increasing plasma triacylglycerol. Most of the toxic effects of propranolol result from non-selective beta blockade.
The most significant of these predictable extensions of the beta blocking action occur in patients with bradycardia or cardiac conduction disease, asthma, peripheral vascular insufficiency, and diabetes. Dose of these drugs must be tapered over two to three weeks in patients with hypertension and ischemic heart disease because abrupt withdrawal of these agents may induce angina, myocardial infarction, or even sudden death in patients with ischemic heart disease. Some patients experience a withdrawal syndrome when propranolol is discontinued after prolonged regular use involving upregulation or supersensitivity of beta adrenoceptors. It is manifested by nervousness, tachycardia, increased intensity of angina, increase of blood pressure, and myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction has been reported in a few patients. Although, the frequency of these complications is probably low, propranolol should not be discontinued immediately. Resting bradycardia and a reduction in the heart rate during exercise are markers of propranolol's beta blocking effect and alterations in these parameters may be used as guides for regulation of dosage. Propranolol can be administered twice daily and slow release preparations are available. Suggested initial dose of propranolol is 80 mg per day. Usual maintenance dose range of propranolol is 80 to 480 mg per day. In moderate renal insufficiency, reduction of dose of propranolol is not required. Suggested initial dose of metoprolol is 50 to 100 mg per day. Usual maintenance dose range of metoprolol is 200 to 400 mg per day. In moderate renal insufficiency, reduction of dose of metoprolol is not required. Suggested initial dose of atenolol is 50 mg per day. Usual maintenance dose range of atenolol is 50 to 100 mg per day. In moderate renal insufficiency, it is required to decrease the dose of the drug and patients with reduced renal function should receive lower doses. Nadolol is usually begun at a dosage of 40 mg per day, cartiolol at 2.5 mg per day, batoxolol at 10 mg per day, and bisoprolol at 5 mg per day. In order to obtain a satisfactory therapeutic effect, increases in dosage should take place no more often than every four or five days. Patients with reduced renal function should receive correspondingly reduced doses of nadolol and cartiolol. Daily doses of pindolol start at 10 mg, of acibutolol at 400 mg, and of pinbutolol at 20 mg. Esmolol is administered as a loading dose of 0.5 to 1 mg per kilogram, followed by a constant infusion. The infusion is typically started at 50 to 150 microgram per kilogram per minute, and the dose increased every 5 minutes, up to 300 microgram per kilogram per minute, as needed to achieve the desired therapeutic effect. Here we reach the end of our discussion. We will continue our discussion on antihypertensive agents in our upcoming videos. Don't forget to subscribe our channel.